Good, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on which side of the continent you are. Uh, my name is Sophie Boisseau du Rocher, and I am working as a research fellow at the Center for Asian Studies, IFRI uh, Paris. Um, we can't begin this uh, crisis meeting without uh, warmly thanking uh, the CSIS team. You know, despite the difficulties of the uh, sanitary crisis, um, they just organized the meeting perfectly well and in a very efficient way. And for that, I want to thank uh, precisely Medellina, uh, Fifi, Bert, everyone who contributed, you know, to um, this dissemination workshop. Well, two hours are very short indeed for uh, the number of participants we have around this uh, virtual table. So um, let me introduce without further delay our uh, two opening, uh, speakers for the opening remarks. Uh, Philippe Vermonte, Executive Director of uh, CSIS Jakarta. Hello, Philippe. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hi, and, thank you. And uh, Jacques Leder. A scientific director for uh, the Chrysia project based uh, in Bangkok. Uh, hello, Jacques. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, just to make it clear from the very beginning, Chrysia means um, competing regional integration um, in Southeast Asia. So, Philip, the floor is yours for 10 minutes introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. I'll try to be very brief. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome to this uh, event, today's event. And uh, for that, I'd like to thank uh, Chrysia Consortium uh, for the collaboration with us here at CSIS, uh, led by my colleague uh, Medelina, as well as uh, Dr. Safia Muhibat. <clears throat> uh, CSIS is happy to be the knowledge partner of Chrysia in doing the research. And then uh, also thank to uh, Mr. Jacques uh, Leder, scientific coordinator of Chrysia, and then, the, of course, as mentioned by Sophie earlier, this today's uh, workshop would not be possible without the hard work of uh, my colleague, Dr. Medelina, uh, Fifi, Dr. Safia Muhibat, and, uh, and, uh, and, and Belt uh, in the team of the Knowledge Management at CSIS. And uh, I regret that we could not welcome you all physically uh, to Indonesia as planned about a year ago. But uh, of course, COVID-19 uh, changed our plan, but uh, somehow I think we are also uh, be glad that uh, now we are being facilitated by technology so we can even gather more people uh, for the discussion. That's, I think, uh, the, the positive side of uh, COVID-19 as far as uh, webinars and uh, exchange of ideas uh, are concerned. And uh, also I'd like to thank all the speakers and moderators. Uh, the two topics uh, I think uh, are very relevant. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, ASEAN centrality and then uh, tomorrow we are going to discuss about how the countries in Southeast Asia are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, of course naturally countries uh, tend to be uh, very inward looking uh, in dealing with the pandemic but we uh, who are studying international relations uh, we know more clearly now that uh, no country can deal with the pandemic uh, alone. <clears throat> and then we need to exhaust uh, all uh, platform for cooperation so that we can uh, deal with the pandemic uh, together. And that includes regional organization, uh, ASEAN, although the research, of course, was uh, planned and was uh, conducted uh, before the pandemic hit us. But uh, regardless, uh, the inherent uh, problems of various regional organizations are worth uh, discussing. And then the, that includes ASEAN and uh, other regional organizations, uh, probably including uh, EU, that is now also facing uh, challenges of its own. And then the, <clears throat> the consequence of Brexit and so on and so forth. And uh, ASEAN also has our own problem, especially uh, as ASEAN uh, has been trying to manage uh, the, the, the relation with the great powers uh, that are competing, as we know, uh, China and the United States. So our task, I think, knowing that no regional organization uh, is perfect, uh, our task is to identify a way out to compensate uh, the perceived weaknesses 
so that the regional organization can uh, effectively serve uh, the, the, the people of their own member countries first, uh, and then the international community at large uh, second. And then uh, by, I think, uh, doing this discussion today and tomorrow, uh, I'm hoping that we are going to have a, a fruitful discussion, uh, as well as uh, exchange of ideas and uh, probably uh, uh, future uh, and then the uh, more co collaboration between the CSIS and between scholars in Southeast Asia and Indonesia with uh, friends and colleagues and researchers in, in Europe and in Crisia for that matter. Uh, I think uh, that's uh, what I can uh, say in the beginning of this uh, two days uh, discussions and I return the microphone to Sophie. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Philip, for these uh, opening remarks. Uh, may I give the floor to Jacques uh, for a presentation of the Crisia project? So I, I don't know if Jacques can make it because he's based in Bangkok and he said yesterday that with the confinement, uh, the internet connection uh, are rather weak because everybody is using them. Uh, Jacques, are you around? I saw you at the very beginning. Okay, if Jacques can't make it, maybe can I turn to uh, Andrew Ardi? Andrew Ardi is the uh, uh, manager of the uh, Crisia project, currently based in uh, Hanoi, I guess. Sophie, I, I see Jack. Uh, I think he's ready. Ah, okay, thank you. <laughs> Please, Jack. Uh, hi, all. Do you hear me? Yeah, thank you, Jack. Okay. Um, Mr. Bamonte at CSIS, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear speakers and uh, colleagues and friends, uh, I have some serious internet connection problems here in Bangkok over the last two days. Maybe it's due to a lot of home office uh, use these days. Anyway, I'm overwhelmed that we can have today's event thanks to all those in Jakarta who made it possible. Now, let me first extend my best wishes for the new year uh, to all of those who attend the event today and tomorrow. Uh, and then let me thank all our friends at CSIF who have contributed to organize uh, today's dissemination workshop. First of all, the team uh, around Medellina. Mm -hmm. Now, these are difficult times and most of us have been in a learning curve over the last months to adjust to the organization and also participation at virtual events. Uh, this one was planned physically uh, for last June, and we have it now here today. Uh, that's great, and uh, I think we are secure hands with our Indonesian friends. Now, as the scientific coordinator, uh, CRISI has been very much uh, with me uh, over the last three years. And the reason I start to give thanks first is because as the scientific coordinator, I'm deeply indebted uh, at each event of the project to the help of people uh, from our academic partner institutions. Now, these are colleagues from no less than 10 countries of the EU and ASEAN. And this quasi project uh, now has been running since December 2017. It's now in its final phase. Now, what's CRISI? It's been said already, it's the acronym of Competing Regional Integrations in uh, Southeast Asia, an EU-supported research project that addresses the forces and challenges uh, pushing ASEAN towards integration or alternately uh, raising the risks and threats of disintegration. Uh, the dissemination workshop today reflects work done by researchers Looking at the region as a whole, it embraces, therefore, uh, a series of topics in the geopolitical context of ASEAN. Today's Jakarta workshop is number five in a series of events, which presents results of academic research to a wider audience, uh, to anyone who takes an interest in the challenges which ASEAN is facing. 
And communication of research has been our commitment over the last three years. And I trust that today and tomorrow we will be successful to do well. As our partners at CIS have designed an outlay of relatively short presentations with respondents who will keep us alert, I think, to focus on these issues that are reviewed. Now, CRISI as a whole is an international project. It includes over 70 researchers from institutions from Italy, France, Malaysia, Vietnam, Germany, Portugal, Indonesia, the Philippines, the UK, Myanmar, and Thailand, as well as Poland. It's composed of five work packages, uh, which each are clusters focusing on the themes of the environment, the economy, the state, identity, and the region. Our first dissemination workshop uh, took place in Manila in January 2018, in those pre-COVID days, uh, which we remember fondly right now. Our objective then, as now, was to share the outcome of research done in cooperation and exchange between researchers uh, from EU countries and ASEAN countries. Now, our objective was to engage with political and diplomatic actors, with civil society actors, as well as with our colleagues, academic colleagues in the field. Our objective was also to support emerging research and deliver results uh, beyond academic publishing. Now, after Manila, we had events in similar events in Kuala Lumpur, in Yangon, and in Chiang Mai. To be true, each of these events was really very different, different publics, different speakers, different questions, reactions, and the overall experiences to discuss and share. Now, as you all know, difference is enriching, but we definitely had not imagined to be hit by a pandemic. Uh, when we gathered last year in, in February uh, for a research workshop in, in North Thailand, but COVID-19 did not disintegrate us. It rather strengthened our commitment to bring this project to a successful end. Like others, we were inspired, or let's say many of us were inspired to document what was happening in the countries uh, where we're doing research and the region we study. Now that's why we are going to have two uh, sessions spread over two days, as has been said, to deal with issues that we had earlier been programming and also speakers now integrating the impact of COVID uh, to their ongoing research. Now, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, time is of the essence. Let me stop here and hand over back to Sophie, uh, our moderator today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jacques, for this uh, presentation of the uh, project. Uh, very stimulating project indeed. Uh, for the last three years. So as um, Jack said, um, I was in charge of uh, work package five. Um, our working group is uh, dedicated to ASEAN, uh, to its so-called centrality and uh, also to its uh, integration schemes, you know. So how did these schemes uh, evolve? Under what kind of circumstances and pressure and most important, um, what did we learn uh, from uh, this transformation to better appreciate uh, ASEAN, um, its ability to manage uh, new challenges and heavy challenges um, and to preserve its influence in the future? Um, another related question we had in mind, uh, but with concrete implication for Brussels, uh, was uh, to what extent uh, did uh, these transformations work for a convergence or a di distancing, a divergence might be too strong a word, uh, with the EU? So if ASEAN matter with its own rationals and um, its specific regionalism, um, the challenge for the EU is how could uh, Brussels uh, contribute to the resilience and uh, integration uh, of ASEAN in its own ways. So our premise was uh, simple and based on one uh, observation, you know, the fuzzy nature of uh, ASEAN. When I begin my, began my PhD uh, on ASEAN, I met uh, Tanat Koman, you know, um, who was the 
Thai father of uh, ASEAN. And he told me, you know, ASEAN is like a mollusk. You know, it's uh, very difficult to catch, but yet it exists. Uh, and then, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting um, uh, remark because uh, we are still dealing today with uh, this uh, mollusk na nature of, uh, of ASEAN using the same vocabulary at the EU. You should notice that uh, the terms um, integration or community are more frequently promoted, but yet um, with different meanings and, uh, and implications. Uh, so this, you know, difference uh, just produce a misunderstanding and a frustration. Uh, yet, um, the use of this terminology uh, often appears in a contradiction uh, with the practice and explain in um, Diana Mendoza's words, uh, the why after 53 years, ASEAN is still resilient, but weak. Uh, so Work Packet 5 wanted to explore, you know, this apparent uh, contradiction um, is ASEAN resilient because it is weak? Um, can it remain resilient despite its weaknesses? And uh, what does it mean concretely for ASEAN's future and um, for its partners? Um, despite a successive uh, reforms and adjustment, ASEAN has not changed its basic formula, to be clear. Um, national interest, mutual non-interference in domestic affairs, informal consensus building, inclusivity and flexibility. So the forces behind uh, ASEAN's establishment, forces of nationalism, of ethnicity, plus uh, socioeconomic pressures and uh, external turbulences are still uh, prevalent um, when simultaneously uh, the ASEAN community is not supported by a strong uh, entity or identity. Um, when asked about its substance, um, the citizens from ASEAN member states uh, remains vague uh, without much knowledge on what is, uh, what substance is behind uh, the association. And indeed, um, it's still surprising to uh, observe how uh, five decades after its launching, uh, the public interest uh, in ASEAN at first is still low. Um, yet, uh, simultaneously, um, ASEAN has, pro has proven its utility and added value. Uh, so, and, and, and I guess, you know, in the chaotic time um, uh, in front of us, ahead of us, um, we, should, we should acknowledge, you know, this added value, even if it's not where um, it was expected. And in, it, in many respects, uh, it deserves its uh, centrality. So, main question was, can ASEAN, as Philip uh, Vermonte said, you know, can ASEAN maintain this ambiguity as the association and its centrality are called into question from many quarters? Current crisis of globalization and multilateralism with its uh, ramification in Southeast Asia, in every dimension, social, political, economic, strategic. The Chinese factor, which has a major impact uh, on the institution, an impact that, that brings into question, uh, that brings us to the question of um, the ASEAN way efficiency uh, in a context of superpower transition, and an impact also mechanically on ASEAN-US relations. The persistent divide among uh, ASEAN member states and uh, the regular domestic uh, political crisis uh, creating an absence of uh, leadership or um, a rise for populist nationalism. Anyway, in both cases, a lack of support uh, for the association. So all these factors among other uh, and obviously, you know, the, the sanitary crisis was not uh, taken into consideration at the launching uh, of the uh, project, have an impact on uh, the structural parameters that have framed uh, ASEAN. And even today, you know, more and more observers are uh, pessimistic about ASEAN's ability to hold together the group, or at least 
uh, to continue playing a leading role um, in regional cooperation. ASEAN is not immune from uh, inner weaknesses, from strong divergences, from external manipulations or the pressure of um, other uh, institution. Um, also new connectivities, uh, emerging uh, regional networks, um, redefine the rules, you know, competing or cooperating uh, with ASEAN, you know, um, these actors may negotiate with ASEAN, they may ignore ASEAN, or they may, in, they may instrumentalize uh, the uh, association. So how does ASEAN react uh, to this new configuration to preserve um, its position? So considering uh, this um, new chaotic context, uh, the crucial question that came into our mind at the launching of the project was facing the risk of being uh, sidelined, uh, can, and if yes, how, ASEAN integration schemes and ASEAN centrality can adjust and uh, ASEAN preserve, you know, this uh, uh, centrality. Obviously, uh, the risk of destabilization, marginalization, or erosion of ASEAN uh, would lead to a highly uh, detrimental uh, disintegration process with direct repercussion on um, East Asian dynamics. Uh, this only confirms, you know, that uh, ASEAN matters. Um, but this kind of hypothesis should be uh, tested uh, on the ground. Um, so it should. Um, so what our purpose was to question, you know, the uh, current reality of uh, ASEAN. Um, and it should be tested with uh, some points in mind. First, uh, ASEAN is not an autonomous entity, but the sum of its member states' national interests. It's, an in, it's still an intergovernmental structure uh, that uses uh, regional action to the pursuit of national interest. Two, it's mostly, and, uh, and, and dearly, I would say, a negotiation space uh, Meli, uh, Meli Caballero uh, called it, you know, a um, uh, process of interaction, you know, a cluster of networks. ASEAN is a very useful cluster of networks of high be uh, preserving and optimizing the high betweenness between different actors. Um, in this negotiation space, consensus prevails organizing a regional action without running for a regional result, but for an optimized um, national result. Uh, the success and interest uh, of an ASEAN policy for the member states is measured by the impact on their own development and processes, not on the region as such, you know. Uh, the, the, the construction of the region as such, of ASEAN region, is only of secondary uh, consequence. And third, with this goal in mind, it is only normal uh, ASEAN lacks uh, enforcement capabilities, even if the Secretariat is functionally uh, useful and competent, and uh, its flexibility yeah, is also uh, highly appreciated. So with these points in mind, uh, let's begin, you know, with our presentation. Uh, let me first introduce uh, Françoise Nicolas, Françoise is director of the Center for Asian Studies at the French Institute of uh, International Relations, Paris. And she will be the first to speak on RCEP and its impact on ASEAN and its centrality and on the uh, ASEAN-EU trade relations. Let me just mention uh, at the very beginning that Françoise will have to leave uh, the session at 10 p.m. French time, which is uh, 4 p.m. Jakarta times. So for air, we will make an exception and we'll have the Q&A session just after um, a presentation. So if you have any comment uh, or question, and if you want Francoise to uh, answer directly, please um, feel free to send them through the Q&A YouTube or a Zoom uh, function. Thank you. Then we'll have uh, in a row uh, Fifi um, Muhibat from CSIS Jakarta. Hello, Fifi, on ASEAN relation with its dialogue partner. Then uh, Dominique from uh, the Council for Asia and the Pacific at the Polish Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs 
on uh, China and ASEAN, focusing more precisely on centrality, peripheral diplomacy, and intermediary states. And then we will end up with uh, Andrea Valente from the University of Lisbon on energy cooperation and resource nationalism um, in ASEAN. After these uh, four presentations, uh, we'll have four discussants, um, uh, namely Dandy Rafitradi, Richard Aderayan, uh, Benjamin Flo, and Thomas Benjamin. Hello to all of us, to all of you. Uh, and you will comment uh, the presentation before going to the floor and having a Q&A session. Thank you so much. Francois, the floor is yours on RCEP. Thank you, Sophie. So good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, depending on your, where you are. Let me perhaps start by sharing my screen, if that's possible. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Great. So uh, first of all, uh, well, thank you for ha having me here and for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on RCEP, ASEAN and the EU. And sorry for the inconvenience of my leaving early. Uh, well, so I was asked to comment on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and its impact on ASEAN and the EU. And I think it's particularly in line with the uh, pr problems, issues that the, this work package was supposed to address. So uh, let me start by a brief descrip description. Oh, that, that doesn't work. Oh, oh, oh. Come on. Maybe you. Ah, here it is. Yeah, let me start with a very brief discussion of uh, RCEP, what's, what's in it, what, what it is, how I see it. And I, <laughs> let me just highlight a number of features that I think are of importance for the uh, issue that I want to discuss later on. The first thing to mention is that uh, RCEP is an ASEAN-led initiative, in contrast to what a number of people say. A number of people argue it's a China-led initiative. It's not. It is an ASEAN-led initiative, you know, which, um, which aimed at consolidating existing ASEAN plus one FTAs. So the whole point was really to organize things around uh, ASEAN. At the end of the day, we have 15 countries which signed the, uh, the deal mm -hmm. after India pulled out of the negotiations in late 2019. The important point is that all of these uh, countries did not have bilateral FTAs before. So there is a major contribution made by uh, RCEP in terms of tariff liberalization. For some of the, those countries, there were no FTAs before. Now there is an FTA between them. So it's a major change and it's, uh, it's a contribution in terms of tariff liberalization. That's about the only contribution in terms of tariff reduction, to be honest. The, the major problem was that uh, a large um, percentage of trade was already covered by FTAs before. And so there will not be a major impact of this RCEP after it is uh, in place. According to some estimates, 83% of trade was already covered by uh, FTAs be before. Uh, on top of that, uh, the, the, a major problem is that a number of sectors are actually excluded from the tariff liberalization, in particular agriculture, which is of course a very important sector for some countries. And a third problem with tariff liberalization is that the, uh, the timeline for the implementation of the tariff reduction may be extremely long. In some cases, it's more than 20 years. So, um, well, we cannot expect to see much in terms of tariff liberalization. The second uh, aspect is tariff faci trade faci facilitation. On this count, there is a major contribution made by RCEP. And this major contribution is that now we have one single rule of origin. In the past, we had a myriad rules of origins for each FTA, bilateral FTA, and at the end of the day, what we had was the so-called spaghetti ball or noodle ball, and it was a mess, basically. So nowadays, with unified rules of origin, this will no longer be the case, and trade will be facilitated. On top of that, there is also streamlined uh, customs procedures that will help also <laughs> trade within the region. So it, it will be much easier for goods to move around the whole region 
once the RRCEP is in, is in place. So much for trade in goods, but what do we see in terms of uh, trade, <coughs> not in goods, in services, for instance, and what do we see in, on other uh, areas? Well, here, overall, to, to be extremely brief, the agreement is re relatively shallow. We don't see much. Uh, of course, there are a number of chapters on investment, on government procurement, on uh, uh, so, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, on, uh, on services, on a number of things, but actually the commitments are relatively limited. So beyond trading goods, I would argue that it, the agreement is relatively shallow and it, it is not up to the uh, CPTPP uh, standards, for, uh, for instance. One major point is that there is no, no uh, provision on environmental standards, nor on uh, labor standards from a U EU perspective, and this may be a problem. Final point about RCEP, which is, I think, a very interesting point, is the fact that there, the um, signatories made the commitment to set up a secretariat. And this secretariat may emerge as a platform to address a number of new trade related issues. So I think this is a very important contribution by, uh, by, by RCEP once the secretariat is, uh, is in place. So this is a very, very quick uh, description of what is uh, in RCEP. So what does that mean for, for ASEAN? The first thing it means for ASEAN is that this RCEP really confirms ASEAN centrality. I personally already, always have some problems with this concept of centrality, but in the case of RCEP, we do see that ASEAN was at the center of this uh, process. ASEAN as a group was certainly not a driving force, but everything is organized around ASEAN. So I mean, this is not, uh, this cannot really be uh, debate, debated. And it is no minor achievement, to be honest, uh, for ASEAN to have been able to bring together Japan, China, and Korea, and to bring them to sign something on, on trade. In the past, these three countries had not been able to come to an, an FTA. So this is, yeah, honestly, no minor achievement on the part of ASEAN. Uh, otherwise, uh, well, what we can also say is that uh, RCEP contributes to a large extent to strengthen the ASEAN economic community. And if we look at the various pillars that on which the ASEAN economic community is supposed to rest, we see that RCEP may strengthen at least three of these four pillars. If we look at pillar one, which is the single market and production base, well, quite obviously, RCEP will help this, uh, this uh, pillar, will strengthen this pillar by allowing more intra-ASEAN trade and investment. It, it will allow intra-regional, intra-RCEP trade and investment, but also, of course, intra-ASEAN trade and investment. So this first pillar will be strengthened by, uh, by RCEP. Second uh, thing, pillar number four, which is about integration into the global economy. Here again, RCEP will certainly enhance the participation of ASEAN member states in regional production networks thanks to the uh, unified rules of origin that I was uh, alluding to before. So as a result, this pillar four is definitely, will definitely be enhanced or strengthened by the implementation of RCEP. The uniform rules of origin is a major, major game changer, I, I, I think, and will help the development of these uh, regional production networks or uh, regional uh, value chains. And this will certainly uh, integrate uh, ASEAN better in, with the rest of the uh, regional economy and further uh, abroad. And on this uh, specific point, post COVID-19, companies are also trying to make the value chains more resilient. And this is uh, also another um, contribution to this integration of ASEAN in the uh, regional uh, economy. The shortening of the value chains and the uh, regionalization of the value chains will contribute to this uh, integration of ASEAN in the regional economy. Finally, the pillar number three, which is about equitable economic development. This pillar will also be strengthened because some countries, in particular the least advanced economies in ASEAN, will be integrated into this regional global uh, regional value chain. Sorry, and so. Uh, this may help bridge the developmental gap that still exists within ASEAN. So here again, we see a potential contribution of RCEP 
to this pillar, which is about uh, narrowing the development gaps within uh, ASEAN or among, among ASEAN uh, ma member states. And this is particularly, uh, again, uh, true since companies are now engaging in China plus one strategy and the, the plus one countries are very often ASEAN countries and in particular the least advanced ASEAN countries. So three of the four pillars of the AEC will be, I guess, hopefully, strengthened by uh, RCEP. Next is, uh, what about the EU perspective? What does the EU see in this RCEP? What are the implications of RCEP for the EU? Well, three major blocks. The first is about economic impact. And here there are good news, bad news. The uh, bad news is that there is a high risk of trade diversion. Some uh, EU exports to some countries within RCEP may be displaced by exports from other RCEP countries to RCEP countries. And I, I give the example of EU exports to China, which may be displaced by uh, Korean or Japanese exports to China. So there, there is a definite risk of uh, trade diversion. That's bad news. Uh, but there are also positive news. And the positive news is that the harmonizers of origin are also extremely positive for EU companies operating in the region, in the RCEP region. And so uh, we, can, uh, we can expect these companies to benefit from uh, the implementation of, uh, of RCEP. On top of that, uh, thanks to RCEP, there should be stronger growth in the region. And so EU companies can also benefit from the stronger growth if they operate in the, in the region. And this is particularly true <laughs> since the, uh, the growth in the EU will not be too, uh, too strong in the coming years, uh, I'm afraid. The second block is about trade governance. And the implications of RCEP in terms of trade governance are extremely positive, I think, from an EU perspective. What RCEP signals is that the countries in the region are very much in favor of free and fair trade. This is exactly what's behind RCEP, with, with, with what is the rationale behind this R RCEP. So it is a very positive signal. And the second positive signal is that uh, the countries in the region are also in favor of a rules-based order, which is again something that the EU is very, very positive about. So in terms of trade governance, I think that RCEP is good, really good news for the, uh, for the EU. It squares with the uh, EU's objectives. Finally, uh, what can be the EU's response to this uh, RCEP process? Well, I guess uh, this RCEP should give new momentum to EU's efforts to engage with uh, Asian uh, countries in order to avoid being sidelined. There is action in, a, in Asia. There is not much action in the rest of the world. So the EU should not be left on the side. It should be active. It should engage with, this, uh, with these countries. A second um, implication is that, um, well, the EU should definitely also define very clearly a strategy towards China. China may be in a position to take advantage of RCEP, to turn it into something that would be in its favor. And so it is important for the EU to define a clear strategy vis-a-vis -vis China to, in order to avoid China being too dominant in the, in the region. And the final point about the EU's response is uh, precisely about the secretariat that I was talking about before. This RCEP secretariat can be used as a platform to discuss issues. And so this is a positive signal, I think, and the EU should definitely keep an eye on this development. And finally, uh, I want to be brief, and so I have to be super quick. Uh, finally, on the EU-ASEAN economic partnership. So let me highlight uh, a couple of points. As I said, uh, the participation of ASEAN member states to RCEP is a signal of their ability to make commitments. Everybody was quite surprised to see that even though I said before that the commitments are not perhaps as high as the EU would like to, to see them, but there are commitments on a number of issues. And so we see that as in member states, if they are pushed a little bit, are able to make substantial commitments in a number of trade related areas. And so this is good news for the uh, eventual negotiation between EU and ASEAN. A second point is that we see that in the wake of the uh, signing of RCEP, 
a number of ASEAN member states are contemplating joining the CPTPP. So this, uh, again, is to some extent a risk for the EU to be sidelined. If the, if the ASEAN member states now join the CPTPP, well, there will be a big group and a more ambitious group in Asia and beyond, or extending towards the Pacific. And so it, it should be an incentive for the EU to move, to do something, to be more proactive and to engage with uh, ASEAN member states. Third point, uh, I think that the, uh, the conditions are certainly favorable uh, to launch new negotiations with uh, individual uh, ASEAN member states. I'm not too sure that the negotiation is possible at the level of ASEAN as a group, but there should be uh, negotiations restarted with uh, countries like uh, Malaysia uh, uh, and Thailand and uh, acceleration of negotiations with uh, Indonesia and Philippines. So depending on which country, uh, whether the negotiations are ongoing or not or totally stalled, it's either revival of these negotiations or uh, uh, an acceleration of these negotiations. But uh, the EU should definitely move and engage uh, as in member states. And finally, beyond trade, uh, I think that ASEAN can also be a very valuable partner for the EU in its newly defined Indo-Pacific strategy. ASEAN has proven to be a very active uh, player in this part of the world. It has also launched its own Indo-Pacific strategy. And so I guess that if we go beyond the pure economic and technical uh, trade issues, we can see ASEAN as a potentially valuable partner for the EU in its uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Thank you. That was it. Very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francoise. You make it on time, so it's perfect. So we have a 10 minute session for Q&A as Francoise has to leave just after. Uh, we have a first question uh, from David Cameron, Paris. Um, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has proposed that a post-Brexit UK should try and join the CPTPP. Um, given that CPTPT has environmental and social provisions, one that correspond to uh, EU norms, wouldn't an agreement with the 11 members of the TPP, which include several um, ASEAN countries, Vietnam, Singapore, with which uh, the EU has already a free trade agreement, be a better option? A better option than, than what? I don't quite, quite get it. Than, um, than engaging in, with individual partners? Uh, but engaging bilaterally? So the point would be to go through CPTPP rather than to uh, negotiate bilaterally? Um, I, I don't know, frankly. I don't know, David, if you can <laughs> precise your question, I would appreciate. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not too sure I, I understand exactly what's the, uh, what, 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 what is the alternative? The al well, I alter think the compatibility uh, between CPTPP, um, the EU trade agreements with uh, several countries in ASEAN, and um, and some uh, environmental and social provisions. You know, uh, how can it? Uh, how well, can course, it well, well, CPTPP is more ambitious than uh, uh, than RCEP. Okay, with CPTPP you have a number of uh, well regulatory harmonization efforts. So this is totally different from uh, from what RCEP has been able to uh, to achieve. But I don't, I I personally, I mean, I think that the, the two things are totally different. Either you engage with ASEAN because you are very interested in the in this region, in this part of the world. And so in the in this, you want to really engage with ASEAN member countries. CPTPP is something different. In, in within CPTPP, we have four uh, ASEAN uh, countries. Okay, mm -hmm. well, Brunei, Singapore. Okay, Vietnam, Malaysia. But th these are only individual member states. If the interest is in as an as as a whole region, you know, CPTPP doesn't make it. It's not it's not the the, the right option. Uh, the way I see it, I understand that the ambition is different, but th these are two totally different things. So I, I don't think that the, it is really an alternative. But I, I don't perceive it as a, as an alternative. 
but, but okay. perhaps I, I got da David's point wrong. Okay, anyway. Uh, do we I, I guess that the two paths are, are possible, but they are not, uh, yeah, it's not an alternative. It's not a choice between the two. Okay, uh, so it's the other way of inclusivity. <laughs> Perhaps. Okay, so I, I would have to one question on uh, RCEP uh, negotiation and on the uh, ASEAN Secretariat contribution. Um, how active was the uh, trade department, or uh, was it more, you know, the trade department from the different ASEAN country uh, um, foreign ministers? Well, the way I understand it, it the, the individual countries were 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 negotiating. Okay, but the interesting the thing is that the interesting thing is that after the RCEP, from what I understand, there is this commitment for from all the fifteen signatories to set up this RCEP secretariat, and so it it suggests that the the fifteen countries think that the group is really a, a coherent group, and actually this group uh, it corresponds to a large extent to the de facto integration that we observed in, in the past. So this group is, is already exists in, in reality on the ground, so, so to speak, from a purely economic perspective. You know, I'm an economist, you can see it. So from a purely economic perspective, this group does exist. And so this, this RCEP secretariat would, uh, would, be, would serve hopefully as some kind of platform for RCEP member states to discuss with the rest of the world, possibly. And so this is where I see something of high interest for the EU. It could be you know, uh, yeah, a pl platform for discussion on a number of new areas which are close to trade, which are not, but which are not really 100% uh, trade uh, issues you know, e-commerce, uh, I don't know, uh, 3D printing, God knows what, I mean, you know, number number of things. And so this could be a yeah, platform for a further discussion. So I, I see that as a, as a real change compared to what, to the way that uh, RCEP has been uh, negotiated. Okay, thank you. And do we have any idea of where the Secretariat could be located? No idea, but there are, as in France, uh, certainly no better than I do. Okay, is there any other question for Francoise who is uh, obliged to leave and we deeply regret it, but uh, <laughs> is there a question from uh, a comment from uh, our group of- yeah, I'm uh, more than happy to take comments. If you, if you are uh, not on the same page as I am, uh, I'm uh, ready to discuss. If, I, yeah, I've got a yeah. question. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Sorry for not appearing earlier because the usual practice in this part of the world is you only appear when you, it's time for you to speak. <laughs> so apologies about it. Um, I think my question would be really uh, regarding how the EU perceives in economic integration in Asia. Uh, so we talk about the RCEP and also the CPTPP. Uh, in, does the EU view economic integration in Asia as a means to political change, i.e. greater democratization and more greater conformity with so-called uh, Western values, so to speak, or is the EU contented to simply engage uh, in this part of the world economically without other political requirements? So I think that that, that has been a conversation that has been ongoing, uh, especially with Chinese entry into the RCEP and, and what it means for not just economic integration per se, but political change. Yeah, well, I... I... Well, that's a personal uh, view, but I don't think that the EU sees the, um, this kind of agreements as a way to, uh, well, to lead to regime change, for instance. You know, China is a very specific case. And what the problem that the EU has with China is not so much about democracy. It's about state interventionism, which is slightly different. Of course, I mean, the two uh, may, may converge, but these two issues are different. And where, where the EU has a problem is with state in interventionism, subsidization, state on enterprises, et cetera, et cetera. So, and the reason why the EU has problem with this kind of practices is that they distort competition. They distort the, the way that the economy works. 
So this is where we have an issue. Otherwise, you know, the, the political system may be one, one, one system or another. We actually don't really care. But once the, the political regime, political system has an impact on the, the way the economy works, then we have a problem. So what the EU is pushing is, uh, well, some economic best practice, but it's not really about, you know, the, the politics. In, in the case of China, you have, uh, well, a very close relationship between these two things. So, and so uh, we, you may have the impression that the, the, the attempt by the EU is to change China. Well, at the back of, of our minds, that may be the point, but it's not, it's not really the primary objective. The primary objective is to have a level playing field to have you know, a competition that can uh, work properly, uh, that can be fair. This is what is being sought by the, by the EU. And it's not really about you know, democracy or anything. And there is no political conditionality, as far as I know, in the, uh, in the EU agreements, or the, in the agreements that the EU is negotiating. Uh, before Francois leaves, I would like to turn to Dandy. Uh, Dandy, you... Um, you have been designed as a commentator for uh, Francoise. Do you have any comment uh, to do? Sure. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your presentation, Dr. Nicola. I really um, enjoy it. And I agree with most of your uh, observations. Uh, I think regarding the RCP, first of all, um, the RCP is a, is a good news for the world trade, I think, as a positive signal of... Um, uh, for its member, ASEAN and its partner, um, to support uh, trade cooperation, which is sort of, you know, disappeared in the last several years. So I think it is a, a, a good signal to begin with. Uh, I have to agree that the partnerships uh, actually emphasize um, an effort to strengthen the regional supply chain, right? So I think uh, by your presentation, you also mentioned that the, the rule of origin uh, effect is an important aspect that will significantly improve the uh, sort of like uh, regulatory coherence in the region. Um, I think in other words, the ROO effect uh, will be greater than the tariff margin, which is, uh, you yeah. think uh, that the tariff liberalization is not really uh, affect that much, right? So um, I think, uh, uh, but however, I, I think that the speed of the utilization uh, among the members will be depends on uh, the readiness of each member's private sector. So uh, I think the effect of the, the RCEP uh, should not uh, seen as, I don't know, uh, one or two years um, uh, after this. So mm -hmm. there might be a lag, for, for example. Sure. Secondly, um, the, the agreement's quality, I think I, I have to agree that it's uh, comparably lower than other mega uh, trade agreements, for example, CPTPP. However, um, I, I I have to argue that I think it's essential to point out that the agreement uh, has set several middle ground uh, between its member, for example, in the e-commerce chapter. Uh, so I think the agreement has a potential as a uh, you know, starting point uh, of the discussion, for example, um, in, in, in WTO, uh, you know, the, the joint statement initiative on the e-commerce. So I think uh, uh, among several members, uh, we have at least uh, middle ground to, to begin the discussion in the GSI. Uh, on the ASEAN and EU economic cooperation, I think there is a lot of um, room for improvement. I think, uh, you know, the, the differences in, their, uh, in our economic levels, um, geographic, con uh, geographic condition, you say, you may say the, uh, our comparative advantage is different, right? So there's also a difference in human resources and also technological utilization, which is this is a very uh, good uh, potential uh, room for improvement. Uh, I think with um, you know the the European Union also have a aging demo uh, demographic structure, right? So the EU needs a new market that allow potential workers to be employed and also expand its business. On the other hand, um, ASEAN has a, has a growing middle income class consumer, which has an improved education system, which has a potential to supply productive workers. So I think 
uh, more potential sector will be rely on uh, services and also um, um, hopefully labor mobility uh, that, 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 that can happen between ASEAN and uh, also the European Union. Um, I think lastly, ASEAN also needs to adopt more innovation and technology. And this, this is where the European Union has a, uh, has a potential as an a, 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 a important partner especially in the manufacturing sectors uh, through trade, investment, and also technology uh, transfer. Uh, for example, in terms of trade, especially in services and also investment relation, I think, um, I don't know, it's only Singapore that's actually uh, uh, have a, has, a, has a large beneficiary um, uh, through services and investment um, relation between um, European Union since, uh, for example, it's received around 65% uh, of outward investment from the EU compared to other region in, in the ASEAN country. So I think um, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand has, has uh, stepped up their game to, to really um, uh, absorb the investment opportunity for, um, from the European Union. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think for the last point, I think going forward, I think um, the cooperation between ASEAN and EU should focus on more um, regulatory cooperation uh, in order to deepening um, our trade and investment relation. I think that's um, all from, from me. Thank you very much. Okay, well, if I if I may react to a couple of uh, your, your remarks. Uh, well, I really want to stress that if there is one change that RCEP is bringing, it is this unifying rules of origin. That's a major, major change. It's really a game, it will, I guess, be a game changer. So it will facilitate the development of uh, regional value chains, as we said uh, earlier, but it will, will also facilitate trade within the whole region. So it's a major, major change. And the, the, uh, the existence of these very fuzzy rules of origin in the past was a major point of criticism. So, I mean, the noodle bowl, blah, blah, blah. So this is the end of this noodle bowl. So it's a major change. I think if there is one contribution made by RCEP, that it is this very specific point. I agree with you that as far as trade liberalization is concerned, there may not be much to see. So there won't be a major impact for, for two, two reasons. The first thing was that, well, we had tariff liberalization already in place. As I said, more than 80% of the trade within the region was already covered, theoretically, by uh, <laughs> regional trading arrangements. The little problem though, is that these agreements were not necessarily widely utilized, precisely because of the compl complex rule of origin. So the companies didn't know which uh, RTA they, they should be using. I mean, it was messy, cumbersome, costly for them. And at, at the end of the day, these uh, agreements were not being used. So, uh, well, nowadays the, the, <laughs> the agreement will be more easily used and so it will probably be more widely used. So that's a, a second uh, important difference. But I agree with you that this will not happen over, overnight. And if you look at the tariff schedules, you know, there are thousands of pages of tariff schedules, 37 tariff schedules altogether. But we, each country may have different tariff schedules depending on the partner they are talking about. Okay, so you have thousands of pages of these schedules, and this the timeline for implementation of the tariff liberalization is in some cases super long. So the beginning of the liberalization may take place within 10 years, and the final liberalization will take place in 20 years, even more, 25 years in some cases. So it's really, really long. So we won't see much changes tomorrow, not even day after tomorrow. We have, we'll have to wait for some, for some time. So I uh, won't see much uh, in, impact. But uh, I, I, agree, I agree with you that the, the RCEP is more ambitious than we initially thought it would be. If you contrast what was uh, on the agenda at the very beginning of the negotiation and what is actually in existence, there is a wide difference. So a number of uh, issues have been added. The commitments may not be too high, 
uh, but it all, then again, it's a matter of judgment. And uh, you, you always expect more if you come from the EU, you're always super ambitious. But if you judge, gauge it by, you know, from the ASEAN perspective, well, it's better than nothing and it's better than uh, initially expected. So don't, don't be too, too ambitious. And before I, I leave, uh, there was a second question that was asked to me, which was about the, whether RCEP would push the EU to uh, promote its uh, FTA negotiations with other ASEAN countries. And my answer is yes, definitely. I think that the one major impact of the RCEP will be to push the EU to be more proactive and to engage with uh, ASEAN countries. Uh, the EU already has uh, uh, FTAs with uh, uh, Japan with Korea, with uh, Australia and New Zealand. That's not the issue. But with some ASEAN countries, there is no agreement yet. And so the RCEP will push the EU to engage in uh, more active negotiations in order not to be sidelined. And I stop okay, here. I have to take far too much time. Sorry for that. That's good news. Thank you, Francoise, for your presentation and your uh, answers. Uh, have a good day. And, uh... Sorry, good evening. Okay, sorry. Let, uh, let's uh, switch to the other. We will have three presentations in a row. Uh, we will begin with Fifi and then Dominique and we'll finish with Andrea. So uh, Fifi, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, Sophie. Um, good afternoon to everyone in Jakarta and uh, good morning to those of you uh, joining us uh, from, uh, from Europe. Um, thank you again. Um, it's, um, it's been a pleasure for me to be part of uh, the CRISI consortium and to um, um, have worked with um, the colleagues um, um, at least for the past year or so. Um, um, I wrote my paper for CRISI together with my colleague um, Andrew Mantong, so he's also here. So um, when we were uh, presented with the topic of, you know, talking about ASEAN's um, centrality, I mean, ASEAN has always been uh, the main, uh, one of the main topics for CSIS uh, in its research and looking at it from different angles, different, um, different um, perspectives, um, there's always something um, new to explore and to learn about. And I think um, discussing ASEAN centrality uh, will always remain a, a very interesting um, topic, uh, at least um, as an academic exercise. Um, you know, there are many analyses on what constitutes um, centrality. Um, you know, despite relatively uh, lack of material power, um, ASEAN has been criticized um, often about it. Um, ASEAN processes has been central to creating conducive rooms for, for dialogues. Uh, and this uh, ability of ASEAN is believed as an important essence of the so-called um, ASEAN centrality. Um, uh, it, it's best illustrated uh, by the existence of the various ASEAN-led institutions. Uh, you can talk about the, um, I don't know, uh, the um, uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, the East Asia Summit, and so on. Or you can talk about uh, what Francoise explained just now, you know, the, the, the different um, trade agreements, uh, including the, the, the RCEP. Um, and uh, another thing uh, to best describe ASEAN centrality is how ASEAN is able to set the agenda for these institutions. Um, as uh, Francoise also mentioned, I and mean, she took the example of the RCEP and how you know, ASEAN has been um, at the center of how the, uh, the negotiations uh, carried out. Now, we'll talk about you know, uh, ASEAN's ability to set agenda uh, and ASEAN's ability to design all of these different ASEAN institutions that of course you will need to talk about ASEAN's relations with its dialogue partners. Uh, and I think that that's the, the main topic of, of um, Andrew and my paper, which is talking about you know, the, the, um, uh, the, how, how ASEAN manages its relations with its dialogue partners. Uh, the central institutional and central uh, and regional role played by ASEAN uh, you know, has invited a lot of interest of many um, extra regional powers to formalize relations with ASEAN, uh, you know, and, 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 and conducting the ASEAN's uh, external relations, um, you know, through various meetings, uh, ASEAN decide to grant different status for, for its uh, partners. Uh, we have had uh, dialogue partners, sectoral dialogue partners, development partners, special observer, um, you know, and, and a lot of different statuses. So this, this is quite interesting to actually analyze, you know, why there are different levels of, of, of partnerships that ASEAN manages with its um, partners. Now, today, um, you know, uh, ASEAN has managed to maintain um, um, at least um, 10 dialogue partners. So we mentioned, you know, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the EU since 1977, uh, and so many others. Uh, let me, uh, I'd like to point out, you know, to discuss this further, I'd like to point out uh, five uh, different um, issues. The first one, I mean, looking at the historical background, 
um, you know, since the 1970s, ASEAN has tried to, you know, uh, build this, this different uh, relations with dialogue partners. Uh, and it is, you know, uh, and over time it has evolved to ensure that the centrality remains in process. And it is quite interesting to see the, the evolution of the workings of, of ASEAN. Uh, you, uh, we, we might be aware of, you know, we might be familiar with the way that ASEAN uh, obliges uh, the, the dialogue partners to sign the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Uh, and, you know, uh, in the past, ASEAN has promoted the uh, Treaty of Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapon Free Zone. Uh, and different, you know, other frameworks that the, the, the dialogue partners are asked to, to, um, to, to abide to uh, the norms of, of the workings of ASEAN. And recently also we, we, we heard about uh, the RCEP, you know, ASEAN has agreed with Australia, China, Japan, New Zealand and South Korea to establish also the, the RCEP, meaning that, you know, the creation of norms in terms of the trade relations as well. Uh, the second point is on the characteristic of ASEAN's relations with the dialogue partners. You know, what kind of norms um, shape these relations and, and, and in, in what point of departure does, does ASEAN uh, uh, build these this relations? Um, the underlying norm, norms uh, is, you know, you, you would find this in different um, um, articles and analyzes is described as equal footing instead of a donor client relationship. So although, um, you know, the dialogue partners are uh, mostly, you know, uh, some of the major powers, more developed countries, but ASEAN always describes the, the, the partnership as equal footing, you know, uh, although there are, you know, a significant imbalances between within ASEAN and the, and the partners. Uh, every cooperation is pursued based on joint decisions, uh, joint planning and joint uh, implementation of activities. Um, now ASEAN and the dialogue partners are using the cost sharing approaches in implementing projects uh, set up by various work plans agreed by both parties, making external relations uh, as an important pillar for ASEAN day-to-day -day, uh, operations. Um, the third point I'd like to point out is, you know, what are the current challenges? I mean, looking at the geopolitical dynamics and the major power rivalries impacting Southeast Asia to a great uh, extent, uh, ASEAN has been criticized as losing its centrality, you know, and there are serious threats towards uh, its unity. Uh, in the time of intensifying geopolitical uh, competition, ASEAN centrality uh, at the hands of the ASEAN external relations can easily become an attention, uh, especially since, you know, ASEAN engages with competing powers, you know, uh, ASEAN manages partnerships with both the US and China. Uh, but ASEAN, you know, engages these powers to support its, uh, you know, its own agenda, uh, including its intention to use uh, available resources to support um, ASEAN. So this is um, also a, a big challenge for ASEAN. Uh, and to try to understand, you know, how, how this is done, uh, a closer look to uh, the day-to-day -day operation of ASEAN external relations uh, might give some insights about the actual management of great power relations. So that's my Fourth point, you know, how the external relations are conducted. Uh, in ASEAN, relationships with any dialogue partners are conducted within three layers of management. So practical cooperation, technical cooperation, um, uh, and, and strategic cooperation. Uh, and the practical level uh, hosts cooperation at the lowest level, where ASEAN represents uh, representations meet with representatives from any dialogue partners. So this is usually a project level meeting where cooperation is set to look at how projects agreed at higher level are implemented. And then there are technical cooperation, which is the, the, the higher level, uh, usually takes place in the form of senior official meetings. Um, you, you, you hear about this a lot, but that's why there are like a, more than a thousand meetings conducted by ASEAN because there are various senior official meetings. Um, here cooperation is conducted to make sure that agreed objective is followed up by necessary work plan. Uh, and then at the more higher, uh, in even higher level, uh, the political level cooperation is conducted in the form of ASEAN ministerial meetings. Um, so we're also quite um, familiar with this. Uh, and as cooperation with uh, dialogue partners are mainly conducted in the form of projects, uh, such as workshops, um, capacity building, trainings, uh, there are also joint research projects. Uh, project management is the key of how relationship is developed and maintained. Uh, under current mechanisms, uh, projects are managed by two different approaches. So uh, the first type is the fund-based uh, project management. Uh, Japan is an example for this with their uh, Japan ASEAN uh, integration fund, uh, as well as Korea and China. 
The second type is the program-based uh, project management. Uh, the U.S. Um, has this with the, their different uh, project, a uh, program-based uh, cooperation, uh, and Australia uh, does this as well. So. Um, Andrew and my paper, uh, our research uh, focuses on the case study of Japan, and we looked at um, their approaches uh, to, um, you know, how ASEAN showed that external partners' contribution have played a part in further um, institutionalization of ASEAN as a regional uh, co uh, organization. So, uh, what do we, you know, what, what can we assume uh, from 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 this case study looking at uh, ASEAN's uh, relations with this uh, uh, dialogue partners? And this is, will be my last point, I think, uh, which is on the institutionalization of ASEAN. Um, we hear, you know, academic discussions as well as policy deliberations uh, about the role and capacity of ASEAN as an institution. These are often shaped by high expectation that ASEAN has built uh, an autonomous central secretariat that can work in shaping the trajectory of ASEAN integration. This is actually very, very much misleading, um, especially given the mandate currently given to the secretariat by the ASEAN Charter. Uh, while the ASEAN Charter maintains that the supreme policy-making body rests at the hands of the ASEAN Summit, um, the Secretariat based in Jakarta is very limited in their role primarily as a facilitator and a body that monitor agreements and decisions made by, by the summit. This creates an, an intricate uh, question about maintaining centrality vis-a-vis -vis the dynamic roles of ASEAN dialogue partners. Uh, this creates a very um, you know, interesting dynamic on, 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 on the role of ASEAN itself, on the mandate uh, given to, to, to the Secretariat, for example, uh, from the Charter, and the, you know, the dynamic roles of ASEAN dialogue partners, which would, of course, have their own agenda when they deal uh, with ASEAN and how this agenda they, they, they seek to realize through their engagement uh, with ASEAN. So uh, I think um, uh, as my uh, very last point, I think dialogue partners, um, although, you know, uh, for example, in the case of our paper, uh, Japan, although Japan has contributed in the conduct and organizing of many ASEAN meetings and cooperation mechanism, its participation is limited by the intra-ASEAN decision-making process, as well as the institu institutionalization of ASEAN as a regional organization. So this has created a condition for any major power, uh, the dialogue partners of ASEAN, to influence ASEAN. At the highest political level, they should work with an ASEAN member state. I mean, that's the, uh, that's the way to do it. Uh, working with an ASEAN member state, uh, and uh, it, it's not the same thing as for the EU, for example, uh, because the ASEAN Secretariat, as I said, is not at the same level as, for example, in, uh, in different organizations. Uh, working with a member state has, that has adequate out outlook of centrality, a uh, harmonic vision between regional concerns and national interests with solid support from its domestic stakeholders uh, will determine how much a dialogue partner can influence um, ASEAN centrality. So I think um, this, this um, uh, really is the, the essence of how, how uh, the dialogue partners can actually influence some of the workings of ASEAN, which is not trying to push through the ASEAN Secretariat because that's, that's not the way it works, but more to getting uh, working together with the member state uh, with the similar thinking, similar agenda uh, to them, uh, with the ad adequate outlook of centrality, I think that's that's that, that's a strategy that has uh, so far uh, proven working. So maybe I'll stop here for now, um, Sophie, and I look forward to further discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fifi, and that's very interesting because now we are turning to China ASEAN. Um, so we'll see if uh, China behaves differently from Japan, uh, Dominic. Are you ready? Yes, uh, I'm here. Thank you for for the invitation. Just let me let me just check whether can I show my screen with you. Oh, it should take a second, I think. All right, here we go. Right. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yeah. All right. Uh, so thank you for giving me this opportunity to discuss the People's Republic of China and ASEAN. Uh, I'm from university. I'm I'm an academic teacher. I'm not an MFA person. However, I, I work sometimes. Uh, uh, I... <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, centrality, peripheral diplomacy, and consultative regional governance. And uh, because of the time constraint, I would like to address a three quick questions: What, how, why? What is the definition of ASEAN centrality from Beijing? 
how the government in Beijing navigates its policy towards ASEAN, uh, and why does China create a social network, uh, and what is the goal of Beijing in Southeast Asia? Uh, partially, I would like to refer to the, the, the previous speakers about project project management, as Fifi said, uh, and I think it's very very important. So starting from the centrality, what I recognize from reading a lot, talking to Chinese colleagues uh, and sometimes bu bureaucrats, ASEAN is a functional center for China. And uh, they said that it's a proxy organization for managing relations with Japan. This is, this is a priority, South Korea and uh, Washington DC. Uh, and I will explain it in a minute why Japan is so important when it comes to, uh, you know, managing real bilateral relationship uh, between China and Japan through ASEAN. The second social network, uh, I think this is also very interesting when we look into IR theory recently. Uh, Chin Ya Ching, uh, a, a constructivist from Beijing, did the book uh, Processes and uh, Networks. Uh, uh, 2012. And ASEAN is important because it has the biggest number of nodes. D definitely quantity makes social network possible. And through this, China can navigate incentives, offer incentives, or coercive measures for individuals. So definitely through the social network, China is playing with individuals. So they are, they are targeting, uh, I will explain also in a minute, the, a kind of elites, not public uh, public uh, opinion or uh, bigger society across Southeast Asia. And finally, it, uh, it leads me to, to the conclusion that China is all about kind of a consultative governance. The governance rather without fixed principles and the rule of law, agenda setting, as was said, project-oriented mechanism based on interpersonal connections. And I think this is a very, uh, very different from what we can offer, for example, as the European Union or or, or, or Washington uh, to Southeast Asia. When it comes to centrality, I mentioned uh, this at the beginning. Let me quote Wang Yizhu uh, from his paper when he said that centrality is important because the Japanese side did not make the proper apologies and compensation and the direct bilateral relations with Japan could not follow the European model, namely France Germany reconciliation after the second war in order to conduct relatively stable relations between Beijing and Tokyo the central position of ASEAN as a proxy region is critical. So definitely centrality of ASEAN uh, is treated from Beijing rather as an object than a subject. So that's what I've learned from, from this. And through ASEAN, they can, as you see, conduct stable relations with, with, with Japan uh, and then South Korea and then the United States. So it's a platform for kind of a stabilization of bilateral relations between uh, bigger powers. Then social network, uh, as I mentioned, the kind of density of networks, ASEAN plus, as was said, create the space for elite cultivation. Political, business, scientific, science diplomacy is also very popular when it comes to uh, China's, uh, China's policy, not only in Southeast Asia, but also in European Union. Uh, uh, then the public opinion is less important. And if you look into the, f the, 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 the last year, the kind of a COVID time, um, interactions and milk tea alliance started with uh, a kind of netizens battle uh, from Thailand, then uh, Taiwan joined the, 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 this group, etc. So, I mean, Chinese are not very familiar in, in dealing with public opinion. Uh, and this is a huge difference between European side and China. China is targeting more uh, for elite cultivation, while, while we are discussing the kind of public opinion, uh, social society, etc. And particularly uh, from the point of view uh, of uh, countries in between, between the United States and China, the networks are very important. And there is a concept, I discussed this in my paper, Chongjian Guojia. This is kind of country in between that has a very uh, uh, close relations with the United States, at the same time has a territorial dispute over South China Sea with, chi uh, with China. So definitely th this is very important and they, they trying to cultivate networks exactly with these two countries. Then it's a part of peripheral diplomacy, as you see from, 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 from this chart, Zhou Bian Wai Jiao. But they said it's mainly based on interpersonal connections, economic independence, economic incentives, economic coercion as a part of political influence. So definitely this is, this is important. And I find very interesting quotations from 
Hu Ziyong uh, from Shanghai. He published this online uh, in uh, Huang Xiu Shibao in Global Times. What he said is the personal interconnection should deliver relationship cultivation and should be conducted by providing leaders of surrounding countries uh, and their children, the whole families, high quality, quality medical care, education, wellness therapies, uh, exclusive, venue for, for exclusive venues for conferences, international center terms, etc., etc. So definitely, as I said at the very beginning, a social network is the core of China's uh, what we can call it, competing integration uh, regime or competing uh, um, competing uh, regional integration project with China as, as a kind of a leader. Finally, this consultative governance uh, and uh, this Xie uh, Shang it also came from the domestic narratives in mainland. Uh, and to a certain extent, code of conduct might be an example of how they try to navigate uh, this kind of uh, ASEAN centrality with a uh, social network that finally they can manage relations through consultative governance approach. And Xin Hong, a very outspoken person, even recently, he was quoted by, I think, New York Times or, or The Economist when he discussed this comprehensive uh, investment agreement between EU and China. And he said that although mainland China and ASEAN have discussing the code of conduct in recent years, the role of this code is limited because it does not involve disputes over sovereignty of countries in a South China Sea, nor does it involve disputes over maritime rights and interests. So definitely code of conduct, from my perspective at least, is a kind of a vehicle for promoting this kind of consultative governance approach based on uh, social network that finally secure ASEAN centrality. And there are my conclusions here. So. China is only capable to, to, to deliver something new across the region uh, only by developing social network. They can provide an alternative model for rule-based order in Southeast Asia. And what was said uh, uh, by colleagues here, EU is important because of uh, what was said, regulatory cooperation or re regulatory building. And China is not about it. Uh, uh, partly, Francois said it, that, that the whole story is about state capitalism in mainland, but also that uh, the Chinese uh, as they see Southeast Asia and how they can secure the interest there, they, they think that only by intra, uh, interpersonal relations they might deliver uh, a, a more beneficial policy towards China. Uh, China model of regional governance is based, as I said, consultative governance, quantity of networks and interpersonal relations. And finally, they meet ASEAN here. Uh, ASEAN with the need for centrality serve as a very important place for exercising China's model inside Southeast Asia. A lot of similarities here, like non-interference, people-to-people -people relations, uh, and also from a Chinese point of view, a Chinese community across the, the uh, Southeast Asia. However, as I said, uh, there are also a very, very, very big, uh, uh, I mean, I call it weak points, uh, that um, Chinese go beyond the social social societies, civil society. And then they, they see that a lot of kind of so-called anti-Chinese sentiments across Southeast Asia peace and milk tea, uh, milk tea Alliance is a, one of the best and very illustrative example of this. Uh, as I said, from my part um, uh, is everything. I hope I contributed to the meeting and hope to have Q&A session and a fruitful discussion ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you. Very interesting and stimulating. Um, then we'll finish with Andrea. Uh, Andrea is going to talk about energy cooperation and resource nationalism in, uh, in ASEAN. So it's more, I mean, an intra-ASEAN uh, topic, but um, might be very interesting also uh, to learn something new from that. So, um, Andrea, are you ready? Yes. Hello, everyone. Good morning to all. And uh, selamat sore to our Indonesian friends. Uh, let me just, I'm not sure if I'm sharing my screen yet. Yeah, perfect. Can you Thank see you. the screen? Yes. So as you just said, um, Sophie, and after these very uh, interesting presentations on ASEAN and its partners, um, I will now bring an um, intra-ASEAN or rather an inter-ASEAN members perspective on cooperation and more specifically on energy cooperation. So from the very beginning of this whole research, the, um, the idea was to shed some light on the conception of on energy security 
uh, in this regional context and also or, or perhaps even more importantly to find explanations as to uh, why it's quite um, limited. So and for that purpose um, I, I looked into the main uh, driving forces that are hindering uh, deeper cooperation and in doing so I uh, also used the examples of Indonesia, Thailand and Malaysia more more particularly in the oil and gas sectors. And then the argument is that resource nationalism attitudes explain to a large extent the limits of this uh, regional cooperation in this very specific uh, sector. But I guess that um, this um, topic deserves a bit of a justification as to why look into energy, why look at um, energy cooperation, and also uh, not, not least important than, that, than this, why looking at the resource nationalism as an explanatory tool. Firstly, why energy, very uh, put very simply, because uh, we have a very uh, large population, a growing population, a growing economy, and therefore growing um, energy needs. <clears throat> and this is particularly important because energy security within this scenario becomes a very serious uh, concern, especially because there is a very uh, high energy um, intensity consumption. On the other hand, there's insufficient domestic production. There's a very uh, high dependency on uh, fossil fuels, oil uh, in particular. And so these all represent uh, major challenges and hence the reason to look into uh, cooperation. Why exactly cooperation? I mean, we could uh, be looking at the reasons for stage, stage to compete in this um, issue, but differently, we will be looking into cooperation because I mean, we all know the potential benefits of cooperation and the literature is very prolific uh, in presenting the uh, reasons why states cooperate and why states fail to cooperate. So this is one of uh, the potential gains um, highlighted by the literature literature is one reason, but also because the measurement of the energy security of states is indeed uh, incorporating the um, cooperation dimension. I mean, whether states are committed to international cooperation on energy related issues. But finally, this also looks to the cooper uh, cooperation dimension because I mean, ASEAN member states themselves, they reckon that they uh, need to cooperate. And this is a topic that has been discussed since the early uh, 19, 1980s, I mean, or even before that, because in 1975, the ASEAN Council on Petroleum was uh, created. But the, um, the thing is that between the rhetoric and the agreements and the, the um, operationalization of those agreements, there's a, a considerable uh, gap and this is why I wanted to investigate this. But this is to say that this um, understanding, I mean, the understanding that ASEAN energy cooperation is vital to achieve, um, to achieve energy security is there, is shared by ASEAN members. And because this uh, cooperation will achieve energy security, which in turn will be the key to the economic resilience upon which the ASEAN Vision 2020 was constructed. And now the, it is also key to the um, bolder and uh, stronger community in which the ASEAN Vision 2040 is uh, now based. Well, but the problem is that there, the cooperation that uh, we see is still uh, largely uh, insufficient. There is commitment, as I said, to institutional cooperation. Uh, there, is, there are some very considerable uh, achievements, but the fact remains that uh, the progress has been very slow uh, during these already four decades long um, energy related, uh, uh, related initiatives. Um, if you if we analyze, for instance, the Trans ASEAN Energy Network, which comprises the two landmark projects, the ASEAN Power Grid and the Trans ASEAN 
gas pipe pipeline, we very easily understand the shortcomings associated with these um, endeavors. So I think looking at this, we easily understand, we easily unveil the, the reality and the thought that states are not ascribing priority or at least the priority needed to, um, to energy security cooperation via ASEAN through the institutional um, links. And I say uh, stress this because the, the agreements uh, we see are mostly uh, on a bilateral basis as in many other uh, sectors. Um, as you know. So, um, obviously, there are many explanations as to why these uh, limitations uh, exist. We can find in the literature several structural and agency explanations. Um, uh, but the thing is that very few studies on, uh, focus on the um, on systematic uh, explanations for these limitations. We will find that is which pinpoint financial, cons financial constraints, technical constraints, regulatory constraints. But um, as I said, I think they're somehow uh, scattered and they lack the integrative um, view. And this is how um, uh, we get to resource nationalism as a plausible explanation to the limits of energy cooperation within um, ASEAN. We know that theoretically, um, I mean, it's very, it's fairly intuitive that there is a contradiction between na nationalism and uh, cooperation, multilateral cooperation. But this is not, this has not been demonstrated in what concerns the energy sector in uh, the Southeast Asian um, context. So in order to solve this uh, sort of puzzle and to understand the linkage between resource nationalism and uh, energy cooperation, I also looked um, uh, at the relationship and the linkages between resource nationalism and energy security on the one hand, and on the other hand, between um, uh, cooperation and energy security. And in this context, there were uh, I think it was reasonable to admit two uh, scenarios. On the one hand, scenario number one, the idea that resource nationalism and regional cooperation are intrinsically contradictory, meaning that when countries follow resource nationalism, uh, nationalism strategies, they will be less inclined to further commit to cooperative uh, agreements which ultimate, ultimately explains or would explain the limits of energy cooperation. But then we also have scenario number two, which states that resource nationalism and energy cooperation are not co contradictory and can indeed uh, be overlapping situations. And indeed, I mean, from a purely theoretical basis, we can in in fact, um, admit this possibility. And then empirically, I think this has been uh, pro proven. In cases where energy security is indeed the true objective, the true uh, light motive, if we may put it this way, then states can opt for the path of resource nationalism and additionally, additionally, uh, regional energy cooperation. And this is, um, Quite, um, I thought it's very interesting, and soon it became very clear that the current nations we have available of resource nation nationalism are indeed incomplete um, because they they lack um, um, the zooming in. I mean, they are sort of uh, oblivious of the dynamics which are, are operated. Um, behind it, the dynamics between actors, between uh, interests, and the and even the narrative associated with resource nationalism. So I think this is one of the main conclusions and contributions as well as the, of this research, the idea that there is no single vision of resource nationalism and that it is necessary to unveil uh, the dynamics that are more often than not neglected in the in the literature and uh, therefore um, to provide um, a more nuanced understanding of this uh, phenomenon uh, um, 
new, a new categorization which criss, criss, crisscrosses the government, the business and the civil society sides of this uh, equation uh, which operates um, within the policy making uh, process, uh, processes associated to um, energy to energy security and also to resource nationalism. So these proposed um, resource nationalism um, categories um, are seen, I see them as a reflex of the varied degrees of influence that actors play in the policy making process in the direction to or in conversely away from energy security goals. And similarly, I mean, I think this also served to show um, and to conclude that the two phenomena, uh, resource nationalism, when conceived in its pure uh, form, let's put it this way, are not necessarily contradictory. And therefore, that a country uh, following this pure resource nationalism may, in fact, and will, in fact, promote uh, cooperation. Um, Obviously, uh, for the for to achieve these uh, these conclusions, um, a new framework of analysis was uh, developed uh, for to, to understand and to consider the the real linkage uh, between these um, these factors. Um, and uh, for that purpose, this framework of analysis. Um, was established uh, according to the idea, to the, this notion of whether resources are seen as instruments or rather as uh, goals. Because if they are seen as a goal, then the less influence the process is ought to endure from stakeholders other, other than the state, and consequently, the more driven the policymakers are to pursue policies solely aimed at energy security and or uh, other security, I mean, social or economic uh, goals. Different thing you know, on the other side of the, the, the scenario, if resources are used as a convenient instrument because they offer um, an effortless way to conceal other interests that are not necessarily linked to energy security, then in these cases, oh gosh, uh, the battery is running low. <laughs> in these cases, um, uh, it, is, it will be very much more difficult and very difficult indeed to, for states to cooperate. Um, um, I, I fear that I will run out of battery, Sophie. Perhaps I could uh, finish here just to say that I believe this is um, a useful construct that uh, will, I mean, that has already um, unveiled um, future avenues of research and we can indeed apply this, um, this rationale to other uh, issues, to other forms of non-traditional security threats in Southeast Asia and also in other regional uh, contexts. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea. Um, I shall now turn to our uh, discussant and I'll begin with uh, Benjamin because he's, he has to leave uh, to give a lesson at, uh, uh, at uh, four, uh, five um, Jakarta time. So Benjamin, can you, can you comment now? Can you begin? Yeah, uh, thank okay. you for the presentations. Uh, a quick comment on uh, Shafia's presentation earlier and also um, as my discussion for Dominic. So for Shafia, yes, uh, I appreciate your, your in, insights into ASEAN centrality. Indeed, over at my university, NT RSIS, we, this is an, a topic that uh, many scholars in our institution have been debating for a long, long time, and many of ASEAN scholars are also based here. I think the challenge now for ASEAN centrality is uh, two visions of ASEAN, and which vision uh, would eventually prevail. Again, these two visions are not mutually exclusive, but they do represent uh, different conceptions of what ASEAN ought to be. So the first, yeah. Yeah. So the first idea of uh, ASEAN would be that of a leader and a driver. And the second vision of ASEAN is that of a lever, L-E-V-E-R, and facilitator. So in the case of the first vision, if you are a leader, clearly the, the, the implication is that ASEAN ought to lead and to direct the, the, the in architecture. 
But if you're looking at, at yourself as a facilitator, then clearly the, the role of ASEAN is really more about agenda setting rather than to lead. So I think that is a challenge that, uh, which I think politically in, in the different, among the 10 ASEAN states, uh, I suspect our leaders have not quite reconciled uh, what vision would ASEAN wants. I suppose for bigger countries like Indonesia, the idea of uh, ASEAN ought to have a greater sense of leadership uh, it's certainly pre more prevalent, but in Singapore and some other smaller countries, uh, we don't necessarily see ASEAN as a leader in that sense, but really just as a facilitator. So I think that would be one challenge for the idea of centrality moving forward. The second point would be that I think China understands the strengths and weaknesses of ASEAN centrality very well. They have been, they are, they have been working with ASEAN for a long time and they understand. Uh, and, I, and if I may, I would like to suggest that uh, perhaps it is in, instead of emphasizing centrality, almost every ASEAN meeting uh, ends with some statement about centrality. But my suggestion is perhaps there is a need to emphasize ASEAN's diversity instead of centrality. This is not to say that centrality is not important, but if you look at ASEAN, it's 10 very diverse countries with different histories, interests, uh, political regimes even. So I think that's one way to use as a discursive tool to emphasize the need for consensus. So in, in engaging big powers, it's not just about having a single ASEAN position, but to recognize that ASEAN actually has multiple positions. And to the extent that an external country need, wants the ASEAN support, it is incumbent upon that external party to convince the, the, the five or seven different the, the countries in ASEAN with the different positions that its position, uh, it's, it's suitable. So I think that that would be something we ought to look at rather than constantly emphasize centrality. Perhaps it's time to de-emphasize centrality and, and to emphasize the issue of diversity. Uh, to Dominic's presentation, I, I totally appreciate your, your research in China. I think from, from what I hear and, and from what you have said and the people you spoke to, uh, it's certainly a Chinese, you, you should certainly provided uh, some very useful insights on how China views ASEAN, which I suspect is quite different from how ASEAN member states uh, view ASEAN. So that is really the challenge because uh, one might say that while China views ASEAN as really a platform to conduct bilateral relations, ASEAN countries individually view ASEAN as a platform whereby to expand its own interests. So it's less about uh, conducting bilateral relations. It's really a platform to procure to pursue their own uh, national interests. Um, you mentioned about uh, China looking at ASEAN as, as some club, uh, as a broad club whereby interpersonal relations are being translated into foreign policy. I would say that might be true in the early years of ASEAN uh, and certainly uh, in the case of say Singapore's uh, founding Prime Minister Lee, Lee Kuan Yew and uh, Indonesian Suharto, their friendship certainly uh, featured very prominently in the early years of ASEAN, but I think 50 years down the road, uh, one might say that uh, we have ASEAN has sort of move on from that very personality driven leadership into something more institutionalized. In fact, many of the ministers may not last more than three to four years in, in, in a job. So depending on, on political change, um, you might not see each other at, at a foreign mini affairs uh, ASEAN minister meetings uh, in, 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 in the years to come. So I think uh, that we need to account for that institutionalization and, and some of the deeper embedded values within these institutions. Um, last but not least, uh, I think right now the challenge of China vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN is that uh, the extent to which China wants to procure support from ASEAN uh, for its own domestic uh, for its own domestic needs, particularly on the issue of Taiwan. Uh, we have, we've just seen what's, what happened to the United States earlier this morning. And I think moving forward, uh, the, the US, the Biden administration would certainly have to be busy keeping its own house in order. So thus with the likelihood that there might be a gap in Southeast Asia, uh, it, may not be, it may not be so, so much in favor of, of, of looking deep into Southeast Asia. So really uh, the question is what can ASEAN do? Uh, how does it, what, what kind of, consensus are the ASEAN countries able to come together and in response to some of these Chinese efforts to cultivate support for its policies, whether it be in Hong Kong or for, the, for whether in Taiwan. I think uh, ASEAN countries would have to, 
to come to some uh, thinking about um, its response to China. So with that, I stop. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, we do. Thank you, uh, Benjamin. Thank you and have a good lesson. So may I turn now to uh, Richard? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sophie. I'm, I'm joining you guys from the Middle East. So I'm somewhere in the midpoint between EU and ASEAN and I'm using VPN. So my apologies if ever my connection is not at best. Thank you very much again for CSIS for the kind invitation and especially my good friend, Andrew. Uh, I know I'm going to be just a discussant, so I'm going to be a second act. So I'm not going to try to steal the show. I'll keep my comments very brief. Uh, there are three key points that I want to emphasize and I'm going to react even to the reaction of Benjamin because Benjamin, I think, raised very important points, uh, three points. Uh, the first thing is that as far as this ASEAN centrality discussion is concerned, we have to really admit the fact that ASEAN is more the host to the party rather than the captain of its own destiny. I think in many ways, ASEAN is suffering from a middle institutional trap, whereby what we have is not really an optimal consensus-based decision-making process, but what we have is a unanimity-based decision-making process, especially on sensitive matters like security and geopolitics. And we already see how disastrous that has been on issues like the South China Sea. Um, I may differ a bit from Benjamin because Benjamin has correctly pointed out that we are moving away from the personalistic Mahathir Lee Kuan Yew kind of uh, decision-making process in ASEAN. Mahathir himself tried to say the other year that those were the better years. And I think I kind of agree with both sides, but I dis disagree at the, sa the same time. I think the ASEAN is somewhere in a twilight zone between personalistic leadership where we're trying to get out of that. I think we have arrived at institutional maturity. And again, that's very clear in the deadlock and paralysis we see in terms of ASEAN just coming about, you know, coming with, for heaven's sake, just decent, robust statements on major geopolitical issues affecting the region. And I think that unanimity-based decision-making process has made it very easy for ASEAN to be a victim to external manipulation, uh, most especially China, because we're just really in a one way or another in their backyard. Nonetheless, nonetheless, I mean, coming from the Middle East also partly, I'm very proud of the achievements of the ASEAN because I, I know very well back in the 1960s, ASEAN was where the Middle East is right now, a kind of a Game of Thrones situation. And if you look at it, the ASEAN has gone through three different resets throughout history. We went from the general vision of Mafilindo in the early 1960s during the confrontancy to an actual ASEAN among the key members of the ASEAN. That was far from assured, especially in the thick of Cold War. By the 70s and 80s, the discussion in the ASEAN was what the hell we're gonna do with Indo-Chinese and communist regimes. And eventually we were able to peacefully incorporate countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos into the fold. And in fact, today Vietnam is a key member, in fact, a kind of a locomotive within ASEAN in ways we could not have uh, anticipated back in the 70s and 80s. Now, with the end of the Cold War, we went into our third reset. And in that third reset, we had this kind of a constructivist exuberance when, where there was this kind of over-expectation that the ASEAN, through norm advocacy, could change the rules of the game. I think we have realized in the past two decades that that's more an aspiration than a reality. And that ASEAN has been good in facilitating dialogue among great powers rather than shaping the very conduct and texture of that relationship. I think now we're already in the fourth reset, which is a post-American era. I mean, regardless of what Biden does, American hegemony in Asia is over. But that, not, that does not necessarily mean that China is going to be the next big superpower. I think we're moving towards a much more G0, uh, rhizomatic, multi-directional, horizontal order, whereby the ASEAN can play a more important role. Which brings me to my second issue, because... I think we talk about ASEAN as if ASEAN is the European Union or some major organization or a unified supranational organization. ASEAN, to be frank, is a small and medium enterprise without human rights. I mean, it has, what, 300 bureaucrats in Jakarta with a budget of, what, 20, 40 million dollars? That's nothing. But, but if you look at key members of ASEAN, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, I mean, these are countries with 100 million, 200 million population, which GDPs, one of them is already in G20. Philippines and Vietnam could be within that striking distance in the coming generation. So within ASEAN, you already have existing and emerging middle powers. And I think the relevance of that is very clear, that the future of ASEAN 
is also about how we use mini lateralism to augment the deficiency in the multilateralist frameworks within the ASEAN. That is why I think I welcome FTAs between the European Union and countries like Singapore and Vietnam. I hope Indonesia and Philippines will be in the fold. After all, those are the two only, uh, let's say, formal democracies in the region. So it's interesting that EU is having greater relationship security and economic with the two authoritarian regimes. But that says also a lot about the me internal mess in countries like Philippines and Indonesia that we have to fix. Um, at, at the same time, even in geopolitics, we see more minilateralism between the Quad uh, the EU now, uh, European powers, and key members within ASEAN. Uh, again, Vietnam and EU, Vietnam and India, uh, Philippines and India and Quad members. I think that's also the future. And I believe that minilateralism, contrary to the common belief among many ASEAN, is it's not uh, exclusionary or it's not a zero-sum game with multilateralism in ASEAN. Just to give an example, the Philippines back in 2013, decided to unilaterally file an arbitration case against China. This was not supported by the ASEAN, and most of the ASEAN countries kept quiet about this. Today, Vietnam, Malaysia, European countries, and the international community can cite the Philippines Arbitration Award to defend their legitimate rights and uphold international law. So it's not very clear to me that just because something goes through the multilateral channels, that's the only and the best way forward. Sometimes minilateralism and unilateralism can complement the deficiencies of ASEAN. And lastly, I think the European Union obviously is not, I, I, well, you already have Brexit, so I'll just say the European powers together with Britain. Europe has clearly limitations in terms of what it can do in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it's not the United States or China who are resident powers in many ways or have been resident leaders and hegemons in this part of the world. But I think the EU can do tremendous amount of contribution to capacity building among key ASEAN countries. Again, this could be helpful in terms of maritime security, uh, surveillance, ISR, uh, among others, uh, maritime patrol capacity, but also in terms of infrastructure and investments. I think one big problem we have in ASEAN and key ASEAN countries is that we fear, for instance, under an RCEP scenario, China will be able to dominate the regional economic networks and impose its predatory investment practices. Under a TPP or a post-TPP arrangement, our fear is corporate predatory practices, as we see with the criticism of, of, of dispute settlement and corporations' ability to assume national governments under the TPP. I think the EU has great contributions to make in terms of consumer rights protection, uh, uh, in terms of helping ASEAN countries to have alternatives to predatory investments from China. So I think there's a lot that EU can do without spending the tens of billions of dollars or deploying the aircraft carriers that the Americans and Chinese have been doing. And when you put those three together, I think the future of ASEAN is also about how much we learn from and we cooperate uh, with the European Union and European powers. And I see a lot of potential in that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Very stimulating, you know, short but incisive. Thank you so much for your uh, contribution. Then may I turn to the last uh, discussant, uh, Jilan? Yes, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, good afternoon and good morning for those who are in Europe. Um, thank you for having me um, this afternoon within this uh, webinar. I'll, uh, again, I'll, as a discussion, as mentioned before, I'll try to keep my comments uh, short and neat and hopefully able to be digested very easily. Um, based on the presentation my, made by Andrea Valente earlier, uh, it's very interesting talking about the um, resource nationalism vis-a-vis -vis energy cooperation within Southeast Asia. And I'll start by saying that um, energy security within this region is indeed a pressing issue for all ASEAN member states. Case in point, um, the South China Sea issue, the first thing that people would say, this is an energy and or resource, marine resources issue. Everyone is fighting not only against, uh, not only for the fish that are within the waters, but also uh, on the so-called uh, yet uh, discovered oil and gas um, deposit that would be able to be extracted by whoever are capable to, to drill and within it. So everyone wants to get a piece of the pie um, to ensure their viability uh, within decades, if not centuries. And it is in a way somewhat true that we, we can understand that their self-national interest within these um, member states um, sometimes trumps the greater good. Uh, in the way that sometimes the nationalism uh, trumps uh, cooperation. But then again, we also have to understand that there are um, 
uh, nationalism, or at least some, some of these areas are driven also by uh, social influence, as was mentioned by uh, Dr. Valente earlier. Uh, for example, we have the issue on, I'll, I put palm oil as one of the energy uh, issue within Southeast Asia or within the region as well, because we can transform palm oil into a sort of biodiesel, which is uh, an area or, or, or uh, ingredient for energy. But then we also uh, understand, or at least I also understand that behind some of these social influences that want to keep, that want to keep several of these um, resources, there are, the majority of them do have vested interests by certain groups that want to uh, promote um, these resources in better at least or, or, or to propel to propel the individual ASEAN member states against the others. Another example I might like to put forward as well, although this may not be much of an energy, is the resource of nickel uh, that are to be used for battery um, for electric vehicle for EV. Now as many of you understand, I think Indonesia has just recently signed up to $10 billion uh, contract with LG to develop a uh, nickel battery production within the country. Uh, so nickel would be exploited, used, manufactured and transformed within the country and which would then be able to be exported uh, elsewhere. Now, uh, for my kind of taste, this may not be purely a, a pure resource as what Dr. Valente er earlier mentioned, but it's going into that, it, it's going into that uh, area, I suppose. Um, why would, ASEAN member states have this sort of viewpoint, why does this sort of perspective exist or at least uh, uh, are prevalent within the region in, in a way, it is to counteract um, sort of dumping of valuable materials to third countries that would transform, manufacture or, 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 or utilize these valuable materials and then export them back us to, to Southeast Asia. Um, and as for the improvement within civil society, or at least how to increase influence within uh, the grassroots, um, certainly we, there are a number of uh, institutions or at least uh, civil groups that in my mind are very prominent to, to talk about various energy roles. Um, I haven't touched upon the Mekong on this issue. Um, water resources is a very contentious issue within the sub Mekong, greater Mekong region. And, and the Mekong River Commission that is based within the mainland Southeast Asia are very, uh, very competent enough, but they, their voices may not be heard as loud as the others uh, vested interest group within the region. And as such, uh, water resources are somewhat uh, not spread out equally within the sub-region and it's being held by those who are, uh, have the greatest capability. And my last point uh, within this sense, which is somewhat connected to the Mekong and the water resources there, is that the real politic plays a very big role within energy security. As in the case with the Mekong, which has its um, source of the river within China, you see how they're really exploiting this um, source water resources. And in a way they, they're able to put the tap on uh, or off, whatever they're like. And it's, it's now up to, um, to the, there's, I'm not saying that they want to bring the Mekong subregion to their knees, but it's because of their geopolitics that plays a very big role uh, that they are able to control the flow of water and as such control the flow of energy. So it comes down to, to the real politic within, within that specific area. And I, I suppose it will also comes down to other uh, resources and other energy resources as well. Uh, that's my point so far. I'll, I'll go back to Madam Moderator. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dylan. Um, thank you for your contribution on uh, energy policies. I'd like to uh, come back to our speakers, to our three speakers. Um, they have some, um, they have some uh, direct questions, so maybe they can answer directly, you know, uh, and make some comments, you know, after the discussion. Um, uh, uh, comments. Uh, so I will first turn the fl and and you know one question I would like to um, I would like to end up with would be um, in your uh, in your perspective you know for each um, panelist uh, what is your vision for uh, ASEAN's future? Uh, would you be optimistic? Do you think ASEAN can deal? 
uh, you know, with the um, complexity of the situation, while uh, its member states are uh, rather in a, in a weaker position, uh, do you think they can uh, negotiate a new deal? Um, I like, you know, the, uh, the, the point made by uh, Richard then, uh, you know, now with um, uh, emerging powers like Indonesia, Vietnam, maybe, you know, the basic formula of ASEAN should be rediscussed. Um, so what's your vision for, um, uh, for ASEAN in the next uh, 25 years? Thank you so much. And thank you for this uh, stimulating discussion. I think we will um, take advantage of it. Thank you so much. Uh, who would like to begin? Maybe Fifi? Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, thank you for uh, some of the comments from both uh, Benjamin and Richard. Um, I do find them very, very interesting, especially, you know, some of the more um, stimulating ideas from, 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 from Benjamin, for example, regarding, you know, talking about ASEAN diversity. And then also thank you to, to Richard for the reminder regarding minilateralism, because that is indeed, you know, when people complain about ASEAN, how it's not working, how it's not efficient, and people, you know, tend to recommend um, the successful um, examples we have with regards to minilateralism. And I, I, I do think that, you know, it is time for um, a lot of, you know, ASEAN and its member countries to be able to um, uh, decide, you know, what what issues can be dealt uh, by the, all the 10 countries of ASEAN and what issues should be dealt with uh, within two, three, four members of, of ASEAN. You know, we have some very successful examples with the uh, Malacca Straits, for example, uh, and then in the Sulu celibacy, uh, for example. So, you know, there are um, issues that are um, best dealt with a smaller number of, of states, but I think it's, it's not as easy as it is to um, actually select what issues there are um, to be dealt uh, within the minilateral framework, but I think that's you raised some some really really good points. Um, there is a, a a question I think uh, in the in the Q and A feature with regards to the um, Indo Pacific. Um, Indo Pacific is indeed a, a very um, um, challenging um, subject. A lot of people talk about it, um, especially in the in the past two years or so. Um, you know, um, uh, and then um, um, trying to connect between the uh, ASEAN outlook on Indo Pacific and the ASEAN centrality. Um, you know, in the Pacific, um, a terminology used, um, you know, by, 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 by different countries. Uh, however, um, you know, ASEAN itself uh, is, does not um, really define Indo-Pacific strictly as, as a region. And, uh, you know, um, and I think that the question uh, from David is, you know, looking at is, is Indo-Pacific a region that's escaping from ASEAN? And I, I, I don't view it. Uh, from that perspective at all. You know, the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific is more about how ASEAN views the region surrounding it. Uh, it cannot be compared at all with the East Asia Summit or the uh, or APEC, you know, where there are institutions formed. So, you know, um, uh, it is how ASEAN views the region surrounding it, the same way as the US is using it, the same way as as Japan is using it. Uh, so US can have their Indo-Pacific strategy because, you know, uh, and, and Japan can have their free and open Indo-Pacific uh, because those are, you know, those are foreign policies of those countries and they have all the freedom to construct their view of the region and create policies from it. Uh, and I think this is the common misunderstanding of Indo-Pacific and the ASEAN outlook, you know, uh, uh, the ASEAN outlook is very clear in saying that ASEAN does not seek to create uh, a regional institution. And in, in fact, you know, if, you, if you're trying to define Indo-Pacific as a region, you have a lot of challenges from it. Uh, the, the US Indo-Pacific strategy only defines Indo-Pacific up until India, while the, the Japan's free and open uh, Indo-Pacific goes a little bit away towards, towards um, Africa. Uh, the ASEAN outlook does, does not have the, uh, has not made uh, such definition just yet. And I think, you know, um, in the, uh, ASEAN outlook is looking at the region from Southeast Asia and what we expect the region to be. Uh, you know, there are so many criticisms towards the ASEAN outlook. Um, I'm one to criticize it a lot. It's lacking a lot of things, lacking the strategy and everything. But I think um, uh, uh, one thing about the ASEAN outlook is that it's, it is very clear that ASEAN expects Indo-Pacific to be less of a uh, of an area of competition, but more of a region for cooperation. So that's why the document lists a number of areas of cooperation, maritime development, and so on. Uh, and I think this is, you know, where where, where we, we need to draw the line between, you know, uh, Indo-Pacific as a construct of how uh, ASEAN views the region and um, and creating a region um, and an original institution uh, by itself. I'll stop here. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Fifi. Thank you so much.
Um, let's turn to Dominic. Well, thank you. Uh, Benjamin, uh, two points I think we should uh, discuss here. You mentioned Li Kuang Yi uh, and uh, China's relations with Southeast Asia back then in the 1960s, 70s, Deng Xiaoping famous trip to Thailand ahead of reforms in mainland. However, at the moment, if you look into the relationship between China and less developed ASEAN members, like Cambodia, even Thailand, how they approach royal family in Thailand. This is exactly elite cultivation. So we need to we need to still have in mind that China is operating via different levels, as you said. Uh, and what is needed in ASEAN is more kind of regulatory uh, capacity building, etc. Because China is 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 dealing with ASEAN within, I would argue, rather patron client relations rather interpersonal uh, approach, especially in less developed countries. And even if you look into China-Myanmar relations, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi meetings in Kunming, and this is the role of local governments. I, I, I discussed with you uh, in March uh, in, in Singapore, the, the question of uh, local, local, local governments in China's foreign policy. They, they as was said by Hu Yinzhong uh, in the Global Times, they offering a lot, venues, conference venues, uh, sanatoriums, uh, educations for, for people from Southeast Asia. This is strictly elite cultivation. And uh, at the same time, as I said, they forget about public opinion. That, that's also an issue. Uh, so uh, from my perspective, at least, this is still there. And we need to recognize this kind of elite cultivation as a very important part of, of China's uh, relations with us. And however, maybe not with Singapore at the moment, as you said, you're based in Singapore, maybe not with Indonesia. But if you look into, as I said, less developed countries uh, with royal families, this is this might be also a, an answer to this kind of el elite relationship. Uh, and the second to Sophie, I think uh, facilitator, facilitator, definitely I agree with, with Benjamin, uh, but stronger facilitator, as was said by Richard, uh, economies are growing, middle powers across the region, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, might strengthen this, uh, this uh, kind of rule for ASEAN to be facilitator. However, from the perspective of mainland China, will be still an object rather than the subject of international politics. That's my two cents to the discussion. Thank you. How, how does China work for uh, elite cultivation with ASEAN as, you know, as an institution? Well, that's a big question, honestly, at the moment. I need, I need to go through because when it comes to member states, it, it's easier to identify. But as a whole organization like in Jakarta, well, this is a question, Sophie, to, to, we yeah. need to develop and we need to answer. Uh, in yeah, future, I know probably. the Chinese delegation uh, uh, to ASEAN is very, very active. Yeah, okay. I, I think they should be. <laughs> <laughs> at least. Okay, let's finish our uh, dissemination workshop with uh, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Um, just a quick um, uh, final note uh, to say that, well, when I, when I look, I mean, when I think of ASEAN's future, I mean, I, I don't see energy security as playing uh, or as attracting enough attention now and um, I fear that it won't um, uh, get that, the enough uh, attraction it needs um, in the near future because there are still uh, competitive views and these will be perhaps even more evident in what comes to other resources as uh, Dr. Um, Gilang was uh, mentioning in his uh, remarks. I think these will be even more um, ev evident. So I think it is extremely important to highlight and to make uh, clear that national attitudes and regional cooperation uh, strategies need they don't need to be opposed because they are not opposed and the more states realize that i guess uh, i i'm hoping that they will uh, perhaps uh, cooperate more but as for the, the, the vision uh, for ASEAN, um, the future vision mm -hmm. for ASEAN, um, I, I do see some hope because, I mean, we are facing um, and we will face, um, continue to face um, this transition, this energy transition towards sustainable development. I mean, this and through these, I mean, it is expected that ASEAN members will cooperate more closely 
in order to to build um, uh, a more sustainable uh, energy sector across ASEAN. We already see, see some signs uh, of that. We know, on the other hand, that there is much resistance to this, especially in contexts where vested interests, uh, especially in oil and gas, are a fact. Indonesia is still an example of that. But I think that the interesting part of this is that civil society is gaining momentum in these contexts. And think, I think this will have a very positive um, consequence, I mean, a very positive uh, impact also in terms of um, energy policies. So I'm, I'm quite hopeful uh, on, that, uh, on, that, on that point. Thank you. Thank so you. Thank you, Andrea. So now we will uh, close our dissemination workshop. I just want to thank uh, CSIS once again and all the panelists, the discutant. Uh, I think we had a rather uh, stimulating discussion. Uh, to come back to my uh, own points, um, the basic formula, uh, the basic ASEAN formula, uh, was indeed a realistic and a very balanced one because it allowed for a long-term resilience, but now new challenges are uh, tackling, you know, this, uh, this vision. And uh, to come back to Philip's words um, uh, and opening remarks, uh, the next challenge for uh, ASEAN will be how to compensate uh, how to implement compensation uh, mechanisms in order to uh, deal with uh, these challenges and indeed with the Chinese challenges, which has been um, identified by Amitav. Amitav was not around today, but by Amitav as the greatest challenge to ASEAN. And uh, to reconcile, you know, the two visions uh, that uh, Benjamin has talked about. Uh, for uh, having ASEAN still um, in, a, in a leader and a facilitator position. So anyway, we will work on that. Thank you so much to all of you. We'll keep in touch. I think, you know, uh, a team can make a really good work and we prove it again this morning. So thank you to all of us and um, to all of you, sorry. And, um, and we keep in touch. Okay. Bye-bye. Yes, folks. Thank you. Adios. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.